We've been studying the history of the early church, the book we commonly call Acts. We've got to that portion of this history where seven men had been chosen to serve tables. One of those men in particular was Stephen. Now Stephen, uh, being one of those men, he had been given certain powers and uh, some of those powers were doing great wonders and signs among the people. They saw, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, saw they could not stop Stephen as far as logically rebuffing and rebutting his uh, teachings. So what happens in cases like this? Quite often people will make stuff up. They'll make stuff up. They'll take something that's said and twist it to make it say something that was not meant. We find toward the end of Acts chapter 6, this is exactly what happened to Stephen. In Acts chapter 6, verse 11, it says, Then they secretly, referring to uh, the, the leaders of the Jewish people, induced men to say, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So they stirred up the people, they seized them, brought them to the council, the Sanhedrin. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Those are the charges that they make against Stephen. So now in Acts chapter 7 we see Stephen is on trial. He's on trial before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, the highest court in the Jewish land. And they are determined to find fault against him, regardless. His response cannot be equaled. And that's what we want to focus on tonight. How do you respond to make people who make false charges? And this is exactly what Stephen does. He responds at great length to these charges. So he has, first of all, a concise, excellent overview of the history of the Jewish people. His purpose, and this is what it all boils down to, and this is where he's headed, and as it goes on section after section after section, we see Stephen headed to the climax. Because the climax that he builds into his defense is that the Jewish people that have accused him, that that uh, basically murdered Christ, those Jewish people are exactly like their ancestors were. And that's what he's going to show through this defense. So he he does respond to the charges against him. But ultimately, he's showing the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court, that they're just like their ancestors. They haven't changed one bit. And look what happened to their ancestors. And that's where he's headed with this. So first of all, let's notice in the first eight verses, it talks about the history of Abraham, the the father, if you will, of the Jewish people. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran and from there when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land, that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. So he goes back to the first ancestor of the Jewish people. And this ancestor was the one that had been given a promise about the descendants. Their descendants. Stephen shows his respect here for both God and 
Abraham. So, so he's starting out his defense by showing that he has great respect for Jehovah as well as Abraham, the father of all the Jewish people. And he reminds him of the origin of the covenant of circumcision. And of course, to the Jews, especially in the first century, this was a huge deal. Circumcision was very, very important to them. So he reminds them of where that covenant came from. All right, where it came from. Then he talks about Joseph, one of the patriarchs. And the patriarchs becoming envious sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamer, the father of Shechem. Why is he doing this? Why does he include, include Joseph? Because there is a part in the history of the Jewish people where God providentially places Joseph in Egypt. He had told them, he had already said, he had told Abraham that his descendants would be in a foreign land and be oppressed for 400 years. How did they get there? It was through Joseph and all of the history of Joseph. And so he's including this part of the history of the Jewish people to show that God needed someone in Egypt to save his people. See, he's showing how God cared for his people. Very important part of his defense. He wants the, the, the Supreme Court of the Jewish people to remember that God has been with them, providentially caring for them from the very beginning. So then, one of the main characters, one of the main personalities in all of Jewish history is introduced, and that, of course, is Moses. So in verse 17, But when the time of the promise drew near, oh, there's an important, very important statement. The promise drew near, the promise that he had given to Abraham a long time ago about his descendants, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand but they did not understand. More about that in a moment. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, your brethren, why do you wrong one another? But who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. And when forty years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground." I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Now he's getting very close very close to emphasizing the point about how 
The Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders in the first century were so similar to their ancestors in Egypt. Stephen, of course, is by inspiration. He's saying that the time had drawn near for the fulfillment of the prophets, prophecy. Moses is raised. He matures, grows older in Egypt. What did Moses want to do? He wanted to help the Israelites. He wanted to help the Israelites. But what did the Israelites do? They rejected him. This is Stephen's point. See, Stephen had been accused of blaspheming Moses and God back in verse 11 of chapter 6. That was one of the accusations. You've blasphemed Moses and God. Now Stephen is saying, blaspheming Moses and God, I'm showing how great respect I have for both of them. And he's going to basically say, you're the one that's blaspheming them. Now we see Israel's rebellion against Moses. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. In their hearts they turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who's brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, Images which you made to worship, I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Stephen reminds his audience here that Moses had predicted the rising up of another prophet from their midst. That prophet was Jesus. The one that you killed. Now he's, this is very pointed toward the Sanhedrin. Stephen said, Moses, the one you claim to revere, predicted hundreds of years ago that God was going to raise up a prophet. And that prophet was Jesus. And what did you do to Jesus? You killed him. You killed him. Think about how many times since the church started back in Acts chapter 2 that many of the Jews had been accused of killing Jesus. That's what Stephen is doing here. His work, his teaching were not against Moses, but in fulfillment of Moses' prophecies. When Jesus came, what he taught and what he did was in fulfillment of Moses' prophecy. Why didn't you listen to him? But what did their ancestors do? They rejected Moses. They rebelled against Moses. Moses was still up on the mountain and they said, Where is Moses? He's not ever coming back. So what are we going to do? Let's build a golden calf. That's what we'll do. And so begin that decline into idol worship. Into idol worship. Well, Stephen was driving home the point that their ancestors had time after time rejected their leaders, and it began with Moses. They had accused him of blaspheming Moses. Stephen is coming back and saying, "Uh uh-uh, I didn't blaspheme Moses. Your ancestors rejected Moses. Yeah, your ancestors that you're so proud of being in their lineage, they rebelled against God's chosen leader. That's what they did. And during their history, they had rebelled against God's leaders over and over and over again and had turned to false gods took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of your god, Remphan, images you've made. That's why he took them into Babylonian captivity. That's why he sent them away for 70 years. He was trying to root out, he was trying to excise idolatry out of their hearts. Idolatry had taken over them. They had turned against God, turned against God's leaders, and became idolaters. And that's why they were in Babylon. 
One of the other things that Stephen had been accused of in Acts chapter 6 was of blaspheming God's holy place, the temple. So now he turns to the history of the temple and where it came from. In verse 44, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they kill those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Moses had provided the tabernacle, God's dwelling place. Yes, it was a, it was a movable one, and he had built it according to the pattern. Again, he's showing his respect for Moses. Not blaspheming Moses, he's showing his respect for Moses. And that tabernacle had been taken in to the promised land. And it was there in the promised land for many years before Solomon built the temple. This temple. Again, he's showing respect for God's dwelling place. Stephen is trying to get them to understand, I'm not blaspheming the temple. I'm trying to show you that I respect it. But Stephen also says, understand that God can't be limited to a single place. The Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. He says he doesn't do that. So don't put your trust in the temple. That's what he wants them to understand. Don't put your trust in the temple. Put it in God. And then, of course, Stephen finishes his defense in a very powerful way because now, now remember, he's on trial before the Supreme Court. If you can imagine anyone today being on trial before our, our Supreme Court and being accused of something, well, what this person is doing, Stephen is doing, is he's turning the tables on the Supreme Court. He says, I'm not guilty of anything. I've done nothing wrong. I've not blasphemed Moses. I've not blasphemed God. I've not blasphemed the temple. I've not blasphemed the law. But you, on the other hand, notice what he's doing. He's turning the tables on them. The highest court in the land, he's accusing them, essentially, of what they said he was guilty of. And that's what he's doing. He says, you've resisted he said, stiff-necked and uncircumcised. Oh, that, that hurt. The Jews have been set apart by physical circumcision, and now he's calling them the uncircumcised. That's like calling them dogs, pagans. That's like calling them Gentiles. He says, you're the ones that are guilty. It's you. It's not me. I've done nothing wrong. He says, you over the years, have resisted the Holy Spirit. You've resisted God. And what did you do? You killed the just one. You killed the righteous one. You were the one that didn't keep the law. It wasn't me. He says, I am completely innocent, but all of you are completely guilty. Wow. Wow. How did that turn out? Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. They were furious. This is the same expression as we see back in Acts chapter 2 after Peter had given that sermon 
about who Jesus was and what Jesus had done and that Jesus had been resurrected and was now sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Those people were cut to the heart, but what was their response? They accepted the teachings of Peter. They accepted God. They accepted Christ. These people did just the opposite. Showing that there's only two responses to hearing the gospel. You're either going to accept it and, and receive it and act upon it and obey it, or you're going to reject it. These people rejected what Stephen had said. They rejected every bit of it. They were enraged. They were furious. They gnashed their teeth at them. Some reverences believe they actually went after him and started biting him. They gnashed their... That's how angry they, these people were beyond furious. They couldn't believe this Stephen, this, this unimportant, this unknown follower of Christ, had the nerve to stand before the highest court in the land and accuse them of rejecting God. They considered themselves the most religious and holy people in the land. You have some nerve, Stephen. So they were furious. What happened? But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, that's just making them angrier. They couldn't see any of that. It says, You, Stephen, you, you claim that you're seeing into heaven? We can't see into heaven and we're the most righteous people in the land. You're not fooling us. But Stephen was seeing exactly what he saw. He saw Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. So in verse 7, 57, Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They became even more furious. They started screaming. They started crying out and and they stopped their ears. They, they weren't going to listen to anything else. They had made their mind up about what they were going to do. So they went out and stoned him. They had absolutely no legal right to do this whatsoever. And by all by what is right, the Romans should have came in and arrested every single one of those people in the Sanhedrin. Because what they had done was illegal. They had no right, no permission, no authority from the Roman government to kill or execute anybody for any reason. But that shows when people get so angry and furious at what is said, they will do anything. And that's what these so-called religious people did. They went out and stoned him to death. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen expected when he died for his spirit to go to God. He was expecting that. He said, Lord, receive my spirit. He knew life didn't end there. He knew the best was yet to come. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge him with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He also showed a, a true spirit of forgiveness, very similar to some of the words Jesus said on the cross. You know, don't lay this, you know, don't charge them with this. Did that excuse the Sanhedrin? Absolutely not. They were just as guilty as they were before. Stephen couldn't take away their sin. But Stephen was showing that he wasn't holding it against them. He was going to be with God in a few seconds. But God was going to hold the Sanhedrin responsible. And of course, in a few years, the entire Jewish system was destroyed. What did Stephen do? He was calling them to repentance. He had went through the entire history of the Jewish people, going all the way back to Abraham and pointing out all of these things about where, where the covenant of circumcision came from, the land promise, where the tabernacle came from, the temple came from, and showed all of that and about Moses and, and about 
what their ancestors had done. He was calling them to repentance. Just like God had through the prophets and in Moses had called the Israelites to repentance, and for the most part they didn't, he was doing the same thing to the Sanhedrin. He was calling them to repentance, and that's what our duty is today. We're to call the world to repentance. The world will get furious. The world doesn't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about the fact that there is an accountability. They don't want to hear about the fact that there is a judgment. They don't want to hear that there is a right and wrong. When you point out that some, some moral uh, act is wrong and sinful, many people get furious. And some get to the point, well, they'll do anything. Stop their ears. But Stephen shows you have to tell people exactly what they need to hear. The Sanhedrin needed to hear this. They needed to hear it. It ended up getting him killed. But we read that the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And most of the rest of the history of the church we have in the book of Acts is about what happened to that individual that witnessed all of this. And what became of him and what he did to Christians and later for Christians. Some people will actually open their hearts, open their minds, open their ears, and obey. But most people, like the Sanhedrin, when they're cut to the heart, they're going to close their ears, close their mind, and reject the words of God. Just like the Jewish people did century after century after century, which led to them crucifying the Savior. And yes, they were guilty. But our responsibility, call the world to repentance. Call the world to repentance. Could there be negative things happen because of that? Very likely. But Stephen shows us, gives us an example of how we need to deal with it. Not be afraid, but have courage. Courage. We learn much about that from Stephen. Tonight you may need to have courage to respond to the invitation. Maybe you are in need of prayer. Maybe you're in need of, of confessing wrong and asking for prayers. Yes, it takes courage. But as Stephen tells us, it's very important. It's essential. So tonight, if you need to respond, we encourage you to come as David leads us in this song. Let us stand, please.